Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about pharmacology of urologic or urogenital disorders. Specifically, we're going to focus on erectile dysfunction and benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. We'll start with erectile dysfunction. Erectile dysfunction is the inability to maintain penile erection for the successful completion of sexual activity. So obviously erectile dysfunction is something that's going to be affecting your male patients, not your female patients. The same with BPH. So sorry ladies, this lecture is all focused on treating male patients. Erectile dysfunction affects approximately 30 million men in the United States alone. So it is relatively common. You'll likely see patients who are experiencing erectile dysfunction. Um, while ED doesn't affect mortality, it does have a big impact on both emotional health and quality of life. So it is important to treat when possible. The different causes of erectile dysfunction include um, comorbid conditions like vascular disease, diabetes is a common one, um, depression as well. There are a lot of medications that can cause or contribute to erectile dysfunction. Um, these drugs include numerous antidepressants, Um, most of the antidepressants actually cause erectile dysfunction. When we talk about mental health drugs um, and antidepressants, we'll talk about the couple that cause it less, um, like bupropion, for example, wellbutrin causes less um, sexual adverse drug effects than the other drugs. Um, but most antidepressants do have sexual adverse drug effects, including affecting libido and then prevent erectile dysfunction. Um, some blood pressure medications can cause erectile dysfunction. Um, we mentioned this, for example, with beta blockers uh, like metoprolol, atenolol, bisoprolol. Um, these can all cause erectile dysfunction, as well as the thiazide, the thiazide diuretics, so like hydrochlorothiazide, um, chlorothalidone. These can also cause it. Um, opiates, which we haven't covered yet, but um, opiates like hydrocodone, oxycodone, these are pain medications. Um, alcohol can cause erectile dysfunction, and then numerous of the drugs of abuse um, can also be associated with uh, erectile dysfunction. Treatment, um, we have a couple different types of drugs or classes of drugs that we can use for ED. Um, the first line medications for erectile dysfunction are the PDE5 inhibitors. PDE is phosphodiesterase. Um, the PDE5 inhibitors are the drugs of choice really because of their, their ease of use. You take a tablet by mouth, that's it, that's really easy. Um, <clears throat> Alprostadil is kind of an older drug um, that we had first before the PDE5 inhibitor inhibitors. Alprostadil is um, not very easy to use because it's administered via either an intrapenile injection, so an injection into the penis, or an intraurethral suppository. So a small suppository is inserted into the male urethra um, inside the, in the penis. So both of those are, are not very pleasant ways to administer drugs. So alprostadil is not used as commonly. Um, however, we do see it used in patients that are contraindicated, in which PDE5 inhibitors are contraindicated. So if they can't take the PDE5 inhibitor, um, then sometimes we'll see alprostadil used instead. Um, also, penile implants are used. Um, one important part of treating erectile dysfunction is to try and remove the offending agent that's causing it if possible. So like alcohol, um, alcohol is easy to stop using, marijuana, um, drugs of abuse. These are things that are easy to remove um, and that can sometimes help the erectile dysfunction. Or if it's a prescription drug that's causing the ED, then we can obviously as practitioners, we can try and change drugs um, if possible. You know, there are a lot of antihypertensive medications. Um, there are multiple, antidepressants, some of which are associated with less ED. 
So it is important to talk to our patients about this so that we can change the drugs if possible. Otherwise, the patient might just stop taking the drug without telling you, um, you know, because again, this, this really does affect their quality of life quite a bit. Phosphodiesterase inhibitors or PDE5 inhibitors um, are drugs that are used first line for erectile dysfunction. The most common of these include sildenafil, which is Viagra, um, Tadalafil, which is Cialis. Um, also, Vardenafil and Avanafil are other examples of PDE5 inhibitors or phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. These drugs work by inhibiting phosphodiesterase 5. Um, so PDE5 is the enzyme that breaks down cyclic GMP in the penile tissue. Um, <clears throat> Cyclic GMP we'll see is important for maintaining the relaxation in the corpus cavernosum, which allows all of the blood to engorge the penis, which causes an erection. Um, <clears throat> so cyclic GMP is important for maintaining that erection. PDE5 breaks it down. So what happens is when PDE5 breaks down cyclic GMP, um, that stops the relaxation, right? The constriction occurs, and then there's, there's less blood in the penis, which means there's not an erection any longer. Um, but if we inhibit that, that PDE5, we inhibit the breakdown, which means we have a lot of cyclic GMP, which means we maintain smooth muscle relaxation in the vessels that are in the corpus cavernosum. Um, if you look down here at the picture, it kind of shows you uh, what you're looking at is, is the penis. It's been sectioned or cut, so you can see in the penis. This is a flaccid penis here on the left. Um, on the bottom, that's the corpus spongiosum with the urethra. That's not the part of the penis that, that changes during an erection. Up top here, you have the, the, um, the two corpora cavernosa. So those are the two channels that get filled with blood during an erection. Um, <clears throat> all the sinusoids here, um, this is where the blood comes in and kind of fills up and expands during an erection. So what happens is first there's some sort of sexual stimulation, right? And some sort of arousal happens. The man is stimulated and that increases the production of nitric oxide. Um, increased nitric oxide causes the, um, increases the activity of guanocyclase, which is an enzyme that increases production of cyclic GMP. That cyclic GMP causes the relaxation um, of the arterial smooth muscle going into the penis and then um, in the corpora cavernosa of the penis. So smooth muscle relaxation opens up or dilates the area, right? That increases blood flow and you can see the, the expanded sinusoids, right? That are storing or holding that blood. Um, when they expand, the penis expands and becomes harder and erect. Um, again, PDE5, phosphodiesterase 5, breaks down that cyclic GMP. So if we inhibit that PDE5, we inhibit the breakdown, we have more cyclic GMP. So we continue that smooth muscle relaxation, which continues that increase in blood flow, which continues the erection. Um, just to note, mm -hmm. these drugs aren't only used for erectile um, dysfunction. We also can use them for, um, well, sildenafil and tadalafil. We also use in um, pulmonary arterial hypertension um, for the same means, right? If you think about it causing um, arterial relaxation, right? causing dilation of arterioles, decreases pressure. And that's actually where these drugs first came about. Um, sildenafil was the first one of these. And this was in research, this was for blood pressure. They were trying to find a new blood pressure drug. And they noticed that in the men who were taking this drug, they maintained erections for longer. Um, so then they were like, hey, let's start studying it for that reason. Um, there's already a lot of blood pressure meds, but there's not a lot of meds that do this. Um, so they started studying it for erectile dysfunction, and then what do you know, we have Viagra. Um, <clears throat> so we do actually use these in other areas of the body to cause um, dilation of vessels and decrease pressure. So again, sildenafil and sedalafil we use in pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
Um, note that the dosing regimen is different. when you're treating erectile dysfunction versus when you're treating um, pulmonary arterial hypertension. Also, it's really important that a, um, a practitioner who has experience using these for PAH prescribe them. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you'll probably refer to a pulmonologist. Um, Tadalafil is also approved for BPH. Um, benign prosthetic hypertrophy or benign prosthetic hyperplasia, which we'll talk about later. Um, when we look at all of the drugs, they really have equal efficacy for erectile dysfunction. So they all work the same, just at different doses. And they all have similar adverse drug effect profiles as well. Um, the only major area where these four drugs differ from each other is in their kinetic profile. So um, dosage form, how long they last and how long it takes before they start working. Um, so that's that's really going to be the the most important difference between them. Um, oh, also note that um, at normal doses of these, the enhanced penile blood flow only happens in the presence of sexual stimulation. So you don't take this and automatically it causes an erection. It just allows you to maintain an erection longer because it's the sexual stimulation that starts this whole process, right? It's the sexual, sexual stimulation that increases cyclic GNP. We're just making sure that it doesn't get broken down. So it's not like a patient takes this and they're gonna just naturally, no matter what, have an erection for the next five hours. Um, under normal circumstances, at normal doses, that sexual stimulation is needed in order to cause the erection. And this just makes the person maintain the erection. Here you guys see the kinetic profiles of the PDE5 inhibitors, which again, this is important because this is where they differ. So this is the information you're gonna to use to figure out which drug is appropriate for your patient, right? Which one's gonna be the best for your patient and their needs. Um, <clears throat> sildenafil and Tadalafil, or sorry, Sildenafil and um, Vardenafil. Um, are both or both take about an hour before they become active. You see over here, time to peak concentration is about an hour. So the recommendation for those is that they should take it about an hour before sexual activity. Um, so you have to kind of time when the sexual activity is going to occur. They also should be taken on an empty stomach. Um, food, especially high fat meals, delay the absorption of the drug. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, if, if the, the man is going out on a date, you know, a dinner date, and then plans on having sexual activity afterwards, um, that kind of makes it harder because he needs to take the drug on an empty stomach um, or it's gonna delay the absorption of the drug. So the, the timing is important, you can see. Um, and then the duration of action is, appro is approximately four hours. So three to four hours, um, for sildenafil, four to five hours for vardenafil, um, but they work approximately four hours. Now, um, vardenafil does have an ODT tablet, an orally disintegrating tablet, and you just put it in the mouth um, and it without any water or anything, and it just dissolves like a sublingual tablet. Um, it dissolves under the tongue and it gets absorbed that way. So food doesn't affect the ODT tablet. Um, so if the patient didn't want to worry about taking it on an empty stomach, they could just do the orally disintegrating tablet. Note though, keep in mind that the ODT tablet has a higher bioavailability. So the doses of those two are not equal, right? So if they're already on Vardenafil tablets, and you wanna change them to the ODT tablet because the food thing is just annoying for them, you can't just give them the same dose, right? The doses are not equivalent. You are gonna give a smaller dose of the ODT tablet. So make sure you look up the dosing in up to date. Don't just give them the same exact dose. Um, if you look at Vanafil, Vanafil has the quickest onset of action. Vanafil works 
um, in about 30 to 45 minutes. So the recommendation for that one is to take 30 minutes before sexual activity. So that one's the easiest in that you can kind of play it by ear a little bit um, and be a little bit more spontaneous. Now, the easiest except for Tadalafil. Tadalafil is um, really the best as far as, you know, spontaneity and having a long coverage goes um, because Tadalafil has a duration of action of approximately um, well, it actually depends on how long you're taking it. It has a duration of action of really up to about 36 hours if somebody takes it regularly, but it has the longest duration of action by far. Um, however, it does take a long time to work. Tadalafil takes about two hours or 120 minutes before it's at peak concentration. Now, because Tadalafil has such a long half-life um, or a long duration of action, it does allow for once daily dosing. So Tadalafil can be taken once a day, just every day regularly, and um, just to provide coverage all the time. Um, and it can also be done, taken as needed. So if the person's not gonna take it every day, um, you know, maybe they have two days a week that they really want, you know, to be able to have sexual activity so they can take it, you know, in the morning, just those two days a week, that's fine. But again, with repeated use, it has a really, really long half-life. Um, <clears throat> so it's it really provides long coverage. The way I remember these guys is um, for Tadalafil starts with a T, right? So I say Tadalafil takes time but works today and tomorrow, right? So it takes time to start working. So it's not a quick onset but it works today and tomorrow. So like daily, right? You can use it as like a daily thing. It has a long half-life. That's the way I remember it. Um, note the dosing is different if you're taking it, um, if you're taking it daily versus if you're taking it PRN as needed. Um, the, the starting dose when you're taking it as needed just rarely is 10 milligrams. And the starting dose when you're taking it daily is 2.5 milligrams. Okay, so again, that's something to keep in mind as well. If you have a patient who's taking it daily, they decide they can't you know, afford it, it's too expensive, they're gonna take it as needed, you have to increase the dose because they're not gonna get the same response if they're using that 2.5 milligrams once a week. Um, so dosing is important with these. Um, oh, let's see, all are metabolized by CYP3A4. Um, so it's important to keep hepatic issues in mind. Dose adjustment needs to be done if they have mild or moderate hepatic impairment, and they should be avoided in severe hepatic impairment. Um, daily dosing. So daily use and the use of Avanafil are also contraindicated in severe renal impairment. Sorry, that's so messy. Okay, so daily do, use Tadalafil. So you can't take Tadalafil daily if they have severe renal impairment. And you can't take Avanafil if they have severe renal impairment. Okay. Adverse drug effects of the PDE5 inhibitors are typically pretty mild. Um, they usually don't cause discontinuation of the drug. It's rare to have a, a serious adverse drug effect occur. Um, the most common headaches just have to do with the, the vascular or arterial dilation, right? Um, these work predominantly in the penis, causing dilation of the penis, but they can also cause dilation of blood vessels in other areas. So we do see, you know, headache, flushing, nasal congestion. These all have to do with dilation of vessels in other areas. We see some dyspepsia, some stomach upset as well. Um, there can be disturbances of uh, color vision, um, and this is a specifically a loss of blue and green color discrimination. So, blue-green discrimination. 
So that's like telling the difference between blue and green. They can't tell the difference between blue and green anymore. Um, this does not happen, not with Tadalafil, not with T. Tadalafil does not do this because it's more specific for PDE5. Um, just with specificity, you know, drugs aren't always completely specific, right? Sometimes they, they lose a little bit of their specificity and they can affect other enzymes as well. So these drugs are meant to affect PDE5, phosphodiesterase 5. There are all types of phosphodiesterases that do all types of things. Um, PDE6 has to do with um, vision. So if these happen to inhibit some of the PDE6, then we can have the adverse drug effects with color discrimination. But Tadalafil um, is more specific. And um, as far as PDE6 goes, for whatever reason, it doesn't, doesn't um, inhibit PDE6, so it doesn't affect color vision. Um, sudden hearing loss is possible. Um, also, Tadalafil, because Tadalafil happens to affect PDE11, we can see some back pain and myalgias. Um, this is just important to keep in mind because if you have a patient on one of these, and so say you have a patient on sildenafil and they have this disturbance of color vision, well, then you can try Tadalafil. If you have them on Tadalafil and they start to get muscle aches, well, then you can try sildenafil. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that there, there are some differences in these adverse drug effects, um, but they're rare. Again, they're really rare to have any issues with these, um, <clears throat> except for down here. We'll talk about cardiovascular issues that are important in a minute. Uh, Priapism is a um, adverse drug effect that again is rare, but it's a medical emergency when it happens. Um, a priapism is a painful, sustained erection. So these drugs are supposed to cause an erection, right? They're supposed to allow patients to prolong their erection to the completion of um, sexual intercourse. But if the if the patient can't get to that point right if they if they can't complete sexual intercourse and then have the um erection dissipate then that's priapism right if they maintain an erection for hours and it becomes painful and won't go away that's priapism and again this is a medical emergency the patient needs to go to the er and um <clears throat> Sometimes what they have to do is actually drain the blood from the penis using a syringe. Um, because if that painful erection continues, it can start to damage the, the tissue in the penis. Um, and then, you know, that can cause long-term damage or permanent damage. So it is important to go to the emergency room and get that blood drained to relieve the adverse drug effect. We do kind of give a general caution in patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, and the reason for that is that, that there's an inherent risk that's involved in rigorous sexual activity. Um, so there is just kind of a general uh, caution because you're giving that person, you know, ability to complete this rigorous sexual activity that they weren't used to. And um, that itself can be a cardiovascular risk in somebody who has severe cardiovascular disease. As far as cardiovascular issues go, we also have an important drug interaction um, that comes up relatively frequently. Um, <clears throat> phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors are contraindicated with nitrates. Remember when we talked about angina, um, chest pain, we talked about the nitrates. So these are things like nitroglycerin. Remember the, the nitroglycerin, the sublingual tablets that a patient takes when they're getting angina. Um, also isosorbide. Remember, there's isosorbide dinitrate, isosorbide mononitrate. Those are the drugs that the patient takes chronically um, on a daily basis for chest pain. If a patient's taking any of these nitrates, they cannot be prescribed a PDE5 inhibitor. Um, the reason for that is that they potentiate the effects of the nitric oxide. Right? Remember that you give the patient the nitroglycerin because um, it you, produces nitric oxide, right? And the nitric oxide causes the, the dilation. 
when you dilate the, the arteries going to the heart, you have more blood flow to the heart, so you relieve the chest pain. Um, but these PDE5 inhibitors, remember, are potentiating those effects. The erection begins with nitric oxide, right? And then the PDE5 inhibitors prevent the breakdown of the cyclic GMP, so that dilation occurs for a much longer period of time. So when you add them together, you can have this, this much greater effect and this much greater um, dilation of vessels, and that can result in bottoming out of the patient. So they are contraindicated together. Um, I can tell you personally, like when I was uh, like working as a pharmacist, that this caused issues with patients sometimes. Patients would just be furious with me. Um, you know, if a physician would prescribe this, like a PCP would prescribe it, not knowing that the patient's cardiologist prescribed them nitroglycerin tablets. Um, so I, I mean, I wouldn't dispense it. I would have to call the physician and explain to them why the patient couldn't be on it, and then they would cancel the prescription. But the patient would be really mad at me. Um, and you can imagine why, right? Like they want to take this adenophil, they want to, um, you know, be able to have sexual activity for obvious reasons. Um, and they don't really understand because remember the nitroglycerin is just taken as needed. So this person might have nitroglycerin tablets and not have had to take it in the past month at all. They might have to take it really rarely. So to them, it's like, what are the chances that I'm going to take both of these at the same time and have an interaction? Um, or they'll say, you know, I won't take the nitroglycerin if I've taken the sildenafil. I won't take them together. But you can't say that um, because you might take the, um, the PDE5 inhibitor and then go have sexual activity. Well, that stimulating sexual activity is likely to cause the chest pain. So then you're going to need to take the nitroglycerin. And at that point, you've already taken the sildenafil or Tadalafil or whatever, and you need the nitroglycerin. So what are you going to do? Sit there and have terrible chest pain? Um, like, no, it needs to be relieved. So for patients who are on nitrate, these are just, they're a no-go. Um, also, we see that there can be additive hypotensive effects with some other, um, with some other blood pressure medications that also cause dilation. So additive hypotensive effects with alpha blockers. Remember, alpha blockers work by causing dilation so of vessels. So we can see an additive effect there. And that's important because it can increase things like orthostatic hypotension. I'm just going to write orthohypo. Remember that alpha blockers cause orthostatic hypotension. So if you have a patient on an alpha blocker, um, it's not contraindicated, but it is really cautioned if you're going to prescribe one of these. Um, one, you should not prescribe daily use. You should prescribe only as needed so that they don't have this working all the time. And you should prescribe one of the shorter acting agents. Um, so you could prescribe sildenafil, for example, has a, a duration of action between three and four hours. So at least you know that that, that issue is going to be going on for the shortest period of time. And then warn patients, they're going to, or they're likely to have um, lower blood pressure. They're likely to have worsened orthostatic hypotension. So they need to be careful and get up slowly so that they don't get up really quick, have that hypotension, and then pass out on you. Um, <clears throat> so use caution in, in patients who are taking alpha blockers. Um, let's see what else. Decrease the dose um, in patients that are on potent CYP3A4 inhibitors. Remember, we said that they're metabolized by CYP3A4. Um, <clears throat> also, you cannot combine Vardenafil with dronidarone um, because of prolonged QT interval. Um, that combination of drugs causes increased prolonged QT interval, which you guys know can lead to torsades. Um, Dronetarone, we talked about when we talked about arrhythmias. Uh, so that's it for the PDE5 inhibitors. Alprostadil is another agent that we can use for erectile dysfunction. Um, Alprostadil is synthetic prostaglandin E1. We're not really positive about its mechanism of action in erectile dysfunction, um, but we do know that it allows for um, smooth muscle relaxation in the corpus cavernosum, and that, so with the smooth muscle 
relaxes the arterial dilates and that brings more blood into the corpus cavernosum. Um, remember, we showed you on the other slide that when more blood comes into the corpus cavernosum, it engorges the penis, right? The penis um, expands as those sinusoids fill with blood and expand. Also, when all of that blood goes into the penis um, and the penis expands, it blocks venous drainage. That's why the, I don't think I mentioned that before. That's why all of the blood is able to remain in the penis. Normally, if you have more blood coming in, you would have more blood leaving. Um, but all of that blood going in makes it swell and that swelling blocks the venous drainage. So the blood is stuck there in the penis, um, which causes the prolonged erection. Um, alprostadil use is kind of, um, not optimal and that's why patients typically prefer the oral PDE5 inhibitors. The way that alprostadil is used is either by an intraurethral suppository or an intrapenile injection. So it's either um, injected into the penis or a little suppository is inserted into the urethra. Um, so again, this is typically used in patients who are not candidates for oral therapy. So for example, if you have a patient who takes nitrates, then they would be candidates for alprostadil. Otherwise, we prefer the PDE5 inhibitors because of ease of use. Um, <clears throat> here you see at the bottom, this is just taken from the, the descriptions of the different, um, the alprostadil agents. So the alprostadil is formed into a micro suppository that's 1.4 millimeters in diameter by either three millimeters or six millimeters in length. So the difference in length is just because of the difference in dose. So depending on the dose of the drug that you're giving, um, obviously the six millimeter long would be double the dose of the three millimeter long. Um, <clears throat> the little suppository sits in the tip of a little hollow applicator. Um, and then the muse is just the drug name. It's administered by inserting the applicator into the urethra after urination. So the person urinates first, um, kind of clears the urethra, and then we recommend that patients, if you look at the picture at the top here, we recommend that the patient pinches the glands penis, the, the top of the penis, the expanded region of the penis. And by pinching it, um, you can see that it kind of opens the urethra. So if you look at the very center of the penis, the little circle is showing you the tip of the urethra. So pinching the, the tip of the penis allows you to kind of open up the urethra and then you um, insert the applicator, the little thin applicator tube into the urethra. Um, and then you push a little button on the applicator and pushing that little button will um, like deliver or kind of push out the alprostadil suppository. And then the drug slowly gets released from the suppository um, into the penis and it remains there locally. So it's just working locally and you have much less risk of systemic absorption. Um, and you know the side effect issues don't come into play. Um, again, we said that um, there's minimal systemic absorption. So adverse drug effects, systemic adverse drug effects are rare. It's mostly just local adverse drug effects that occur in the penis. Um, <clears throat> the suppository has an onset of about five to 10 minutes and a duration of action between 30 to 60 minutes. Um, the injection has an onset between two and 25 minutes and it kind of depends on, on where the injection is placed um, and a duration of again 30 to 60 minutes. The duration of action um, is really patient specific. It does last a decent amount longer in some patients. It really just depends on the patient specific response. So 30 to 60 minutes is um, kind of short uh, and in a lot of patients it, it does end up lasting longer than that. Again, systemic adverse drug effects are rare. So hypotension, headache um, don't typically occur in most patients because we really don't see that much absorption. 
However, local adverse drug effects do occur. Um, so we can see things like um, penile pain, urethral pain, testicular pain. Um, there are things that, that can occur like bleeding at the site of injection, um, hematoma or rash at the site, but those are all rare as well. Typically it's just uncomfortable in the area and that's it. Um, Priapism, which remember was a sustained penile erection, um, <clears throat> is also possible. So now we're going to change gears and the rest of the lecture we'll be talking about BPH. BPH is benign prostatic hyperplasia or um, benign prostatic hypertrophy. This refers to a benign enlargement of the prostate gland. Um, <clears throat> the prostate gland can be enlarged for a couple different reasons. Um, typically or the most kind of common chronic reasons that the prostate gland gets enlarged are either because of BPH or prostate cancer. Um, prostate cancer is cancerous, mm -hmm. right? There's a cancerous growth in the prostate gland. BPH is named BPH because there is growth in the prostate gland, but it's benign, right? It is non-cancerous growth. If you look down here at the picture, um, this first picture on the left is a normal prostate gland. What you see is you see the bladder on, let me change colors. You see the bladder on top, and then underneath you see the prostate gland. And notice that the urethra drains the bladder and passes right through the prostate gland. So this tube that you see here going through the center of the prostate gland, remember, is the urethra. Now, if you look over here at the second picture, you'll notice that the prostate gland is much larger in size. And the problem with this is that when there's this enlargement of the prostate gland, it encroaches on the urethra or it, it squeezes the urethra. And that makes it a lot more difficult for urine to then exit the bladder. Um, so patients experience urinary hesitancy, um, frequency of urination, because when they urinate, they're not able to, um, to empty all of the urine from the body. So it doesn't take very long before the bladder is full again weak stream so they're not able to release very much urine at a time and then again as i just mentioned incomplete emptying of the bladder now just like erectile dysfunction this doesn't affect mortality but it really does have a significant impact on quality of life of the patient so we do want to treat it optimally pharmacologic therapy that we use for bph includes alpha-1 antagonists 5-alpha reductase inhibitors or 5-AR inhibitors, and then also PDE5 inhibitors or phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. We just talked about PDE5 inhibitors. Um, PDE5 inhibitors are typically used for erectile dysfunction, but we do see um, PDE5 inhibitors, specifically Tadalafil. Um, used in BPH. Tadalafil is the only agent that's approved for use in, uh, P in BPH. The way that the PDE5 inhibitors work, um, phosphodiesterase 5 is not only present in the penis, it's also present in the bladder and in the prostate as well. So um, it works really the same way. When we inhibit PDE5, this allows for vasodilation um, or like vascular muscle relaxation and vasodilation in the prostate and bladder. Um, also relaxation of all the other smooth muscle um, components in the prostate and the bladder. Um, alpha-1 antagonists block alpha-1 receptors. Um, and we've mentioned these drugs, or we've mentioned some of these drugs when we talked about hypertension. Um, <clears throat> Terazosin, doxazosin, and alifuzosin are alpha-1 blockers um, that we use for hypertension because they, they decrease blood pressure. Also, prazosin, um, but prazosin is not indicated for BPH. 
Um, that's not in its indication. Sometimes it's used off-label for it, but it's not indicated for BPH. Tamsulosin and psilocin are more specific agents that we don't use for hypertension. We use them only for BPH. So the mechanism of action of all of these agents is to block alpha-1 receptors in the prostate. And um, alpha-1 receptors, when they're stimulated, they cause smooth muscle constriction, right? Or smooth muscle contraction. Um, <clears throat> so if we block those receptors, then that leads to smooth muscle relaxation. Now, um, the first three that you see here, terazosin, doxazosin, and alfuzosin, those are nonspecific alpha-1 blockers. So they block both alpha-1A and alpha-1B. Alpha-1A is present in the prostate. Alpha-1B is present in the vasculature. So in the blood vessels. So these first agents, that's why they can be used for blood pressure. They cause vasodilation in our blood vessels, which decreases blood pressure. But they also block alpha-1A, which causes smooth muscle relaxation in the prostate, which improves urine flow, right? So improve urine flow and symptomatic improvement of BPH. Now, tamsulosin and psilocin, these agents are specific for alpha-1A. So these are alpha-1A antagonists. So they work only in the prostate gland. Okay, so relatively specific. And they work um, mostly in the prostate gland. So that means that they improve urine flow without affecting our um, blood pressure. So they don't have that, that decrease in blood pressure that we see with the other agents. Alpha-1 antagonists are given orally and they're typically administered with food. Giving them with food improves the absorption. So um, more of the drug gets absorbed. The duration of action varies between them. Um, so dosing is different between them, but duration of action varies between eight and 22 hours. We do see that um, the peak effect is one to four hours after giving the drug. So we typically tell patients to take with dinner so that the peak effect happens um, at night. So if you figure the person takes it with dinner at you know six o'clock, that peak effect is gonna be in the next few hours. So that's gonna allow them to completely relieve their bladder, right? Or to better empty their bladder so that they can sleep through the night okay. Um, during the day, it's not as bothersome if you have to go to the bathroom constantly, but it is annoying if you have to get up six times in the middle of the night, you know, you don't get a good night's sleep. So typically patients will, will want that, that best, you know, um, that best activity to be at night. Um, also keep in mind, it can take some time before patients really see the full benefit of the drug. It typically starts working in seven to 10 days, and it can take two to four weeks for them to really start seeing that maximum benefit. So if you start giving it to the patient and you know they call you a couple days later and they say this just isn't working, you gotta tell them be patient, hang in there with me. Um, and it's actually best to tell them that to start. Hey, you know, let's, let's check back with each other in a week and we'll see if this has started working for you. Or let's check back in four weeks and we'll see you know, if this is effective or if we need to try something else. Um, <clears throat> Silodicin requires dose adjustment in renal impairment, and it is contraindicated if that's severe renal impairment. Um, it is heavily cleared by the kidneys. Adverse drug effects really vary based on which drug you're giving. You can greatly minimize adverse drug effects by giving tamsulosin or silodicin. Um, tansulos, tamsulosin, which is Flomax, is probably the most common um, of these drugs that's given for BPH uh, because it's, it's specific for alpha-1A, so it's not affecting systemic vessels, so it has much fewer adverse drug effects. The other agents 
um, that are non-specific, like terazosin and doxazosin, those are associated with a lot of dizziness, headache, orthostatic hypotension, um, nasal congestion, tachycardia, that's reflex tachycardia, right? Because if you lower the blood pressure, the heart responds by beating faster to try and keep the blood moving. Um, <clears throat> so those happen a lot more with the nonspecific agents. We can see some interference with ejaculation or some retrograde ejaculation. Um, floppy iris syndrome can occur during eye surgery. So this is really rare. It's not like your patients are going to be frequently getting eye surgery. But if a patient's going to be getting eye surgery, they need to tell their, um, their surgeon that they are taking an alpha-1 blocker um, so that their surgeon can probably stop the medication um, and allow a little washout period before surgery. Alfusacin does cause QT prolongation. So that's important to keep in mind drug interactions in case the patient's taking any other drugs that also cause QT prolongation. So remember um, antibiotics like fluoroquinolone antibiotics, that's stuff like ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. Those also cause QT prolongation. Um, also a lot of our antiarrhythmics, right? Like amiodarone, dronetarone, those cause QT prolongation. So it's important to keep in mind um, drug interactions. If you have a patient that's on those agents, then I would try um, one of the other ones, you know, give them temsulosin, for example, so that you're not prolonging the QT interval too much, which again, can cause torsades. Five alpha reductase inhibitors include finasteride and dutasteride. Um, dutasteride, tends to be a bit more um, potent than finasteride. It tends to have a bit of a greater effect. Finasteride was around first though, and it's probably a bit cheaper. Um, I know it went to generic first, but they both are effective. So the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors inhibit the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme that converts testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. And dihydrotestosterone is more active than testosterone is. Okay, so you can think of it as like a stronger hormone. It has more of an effect. What typically happens is that um, dihydrotestosterone stimulates the prostate gland. And this is one of the things that stimulates that overgrowth of the prostate gland that we see with BPH. So what these drugs do um, is they inhibit 5-alpha reductase. So they inhibit the conversion of testosterone to DHT. So we're decreasing the amount of DHT. So we prevent that DHT stimulation of the prostate. So we're, we're, we're stopping that stimulation of that overgrowth of the prostate. Now, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors don't just provide um, symptom benefit. It's more than that. They can actually shrink the prostate as well. So the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can actually improve the disease itself. They can shrink the prostate, and then that improves urine flow. So that improves the symptoms of the disease. Um, we use these, again, to decrease prostate size and improve symptoms in BPH. Um, now, one thing that's important to keep in mind with the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors is that they don't work overnight. Um, because they work by actually shrinking the prostate, this takes time to occur. It does take about 6 to 12 months for these drugs to work. So um, the best thing to do, like the most effective way to treat BPH is to actually combine an alpha-1 antagonist with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. The alpha-1 antagonist will provide symptom relief while the prostate shrinks. 
right? So the um, again, the, the alpha-1 antagonist will be kind of improving the patient's symptoms over the short term. And then in the background, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor is going to be cutting off that stimulation of the prostate. So the prostate is going to slowly shrink back to normal. And then eventually, um, prostate will be you know, smaller, maybe not normal, but it'll be smaller, and you'll have improved urine flow because of that. And then also the alpha-1 antagonist can be providing benefit as well. Um, <clears throat> there are combination agents that combine both of these. So for example, there's a drug that has dutasteride plus tamsulosin. So there's a combination agent that already has both of those drugs together so that you're hitting it from both from both angles. Um, and again, that is the most effective combination to treat um, BPH. Um, <clears throat> these agents, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, are also used for alopecia. Let me just kind of write this down. While we're talking about these drugs, let's just mention that they are also used for alopecia, which is just hair loss. Um, so patients who are who are balding, who are losing their hair, um, can take these agents. The reason for that is that um, too much DHT, too much dihydrotestosterone um, in the scalp causes hair loss. So if we decrease the amount of DHT in the scalp, that helps to prevent hair loss from occurring. Technically, there are two different drugs. So like there's finasteride for BPH is one brand name of drug. Finasteride for alopecia is a different brand name of drug. And it's interesting because sometimes insurance companies will cover one but not the other. Typically, if you write for the BPH drug, they'll cover it because that's you know a recognized medical disorder that, they need, that they'll cover. But if you write for the alopecia drug, they typically won't cover it because they're saying, you know, this is a, um, a cosmetic thing. This is a cosmetic choice that you're making, so you need to pay for the drug. Um, just kind of an interesting caveat. Adverse drug effects of the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors um, are really, they're mostly sexual in nature and they're surrounding the decrease in androgen activity. Um, androgens are the male sex hormones. And we said that testosterone gets converted to dihydrotestosterone. And that DHT, dihydrotestosterone, is much more active. It's more active in stimulating a lot of these, these androgen-driven activities like libido, ejaculation, sperm production, um, the male sex characteristics. So if we prevent the formation of that dihydrotestosterone, we're going to interfere with all of those activities. So we see a lot of sexual dysfunction in patients who are taking these agents. We can see decreased ejaculate, decreased libido, um, erectile dysfunction. Gynecomastia, which is the development of breasts in the male, can be present. Mm -hmm. um, we see, again, interference with the production of sperm. So we see a low sperm count. Um, also, something that's important to keep in mind is that these are highly teratogenic. So they cause severe birth defects involving the um, male genitalia, the fetus. So if you have a male fetus that's developing, um, dihydrotestosterone is really important to stimulate the development of the male reproductive system, the male genitalia. So um, if a woman who's pregnant comes in contact with this, this can cause really bad birth defects. So women who are pregnant or of childbearing age have to stay completely away from the drug. So they should not even handle the medication. So we're not just talking about taking the drug, we're talking about touching the drug. Um, this is important, like for example, working in the pharmacy, um, we would always have warnings on the bottle. So anybody who's pregnant or childbearing age can't touch it. 
Um, so you, you know, can't just pick up the tablet if you drop it, or if you're giving the drugs to someone else, um, you know, if you're, you know, in home health or, or you're taking care of somebody, you know, don't just pour the tablets out in your hand and pick one up. You should not come in contact with the medication. This is just a kind of a nice summary or comparison of the alpha blockers and the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors in the way we use them for BPH. Um, you can see the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors do decrease the prostate size, whereas the alpha blockers are just used for symptomatic benefit. They don't decrease the prostate size. Um, you see that the, the peak onset when they're really like they're, they're finally at their maximum um, efficacy is quicker for the alpha blockers. So it only takes two to four weeks for those alpha blockers, but it can take six to 12 months for the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Um, <clears throat> decrease in PSA, yes, we see that for the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. That's because, again, this is actually, um, you know, making the disease better. It's not just treating the symptoms. Sexual dysfunction is much more common um, or is more common with the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Uh, hypotensive effects, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are just affecting hormones. They're not affecting blood pressure, but the alpha antagonists do have a lot of hypotensive effects. Um, the commonly used drugs, tamsulosin and alfusicin, um, and then finasteride and dutasteride. And again, you can use them together, right? You can combine these agents to get that, that maximum benefit, especially in those first um, you know, six to 12 months while you're waiting for the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor to work. This is just, again, kind of a summary of the different agents. You can see the description of each of the agents and then their adverse drug effects and then combination therapy. Um, here you can see the progression of the disease um, over time. With placebo, you see the disease progress quite a bit more than with drug therapy. Here with finasteride and with doxazosin, you see pretty much the same progression of the disease. Um, and then if you look with finasteride um, plus doxazosin, so we're looking at combination therapy, you see there's a lot less progression of the disease with the combination therapy. Um, and that's it, guys. Um, <clears throat> pretty, pretty simple conceptually. But if you have any questions, please go ahead and leave a comment or shoot me an email and let me know. Thanks.